Today's episode is sponsored by Wells Fargo Advisors Financial Network, Finet, member SIPC. Finet is focused on helping independent advisors support their clients and reach their goals with unique, ever-evolving solutions and resources from one of the nation's largest financial institutions. Learn how you can get more with Finet at wfa.com slash independent. That's wfa.com slash independent. Welcome to the Wellstack Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Rossick, the director of Wellstack Content Solutions. In this episode, and for the first time on the podcast, I'm joined by two guests, so a two-for-one special. And I'm so excited to welcome Rick Bookstaber and Govinda Quish. And today's topic with portfolio risk management rapidly evolving, how can advisors ensure their tech stack is keeping up? So thrilled to be speaking with you both, and thanks for coming on today. Happy to be here. Yes, thank you for having us. Of course. And before we dive into the first segment, I just I like to get to know my guests a little bit better. So let's start with your backgrounds and what ultimately led to the idea and launch of Fabric. Rick, would love to start with you. So my career has been in risk management. I was uh, the chief risk officer for two large investment banks, Solomon Brothers, which doesn't exist anymore. It's now part of City, uh, and then. Uh, Morgan Stanley. And then I also was uh, the chief risk officer for some hedge funds, most recently Bridgewater. During the 2008 crisis, I was asked to work in Washington, sort of reformulate the risk management structure. And uh, I worked at the Treasury, the SEC. And what led to Fabric is really my experience there, where everybody talked about banks. And of course, banks were the problem, but the place where the pain was felt was with people. And so I felt like risk management had not really been focused on individuals. They were really underserved. The institutions had everything you could want. Uh, and the individuals didn't. So I moved into what's called the uh, asset owner side, first being in charge of risk for uh, the University of California's pension and endowment. And then Govinda and I, who've known each other for quite a while, felt like we could take a lot of what I've learned with risk management, what we learned in our time with the University of California and do something that would be specific, uh, specifically focused for advisors. And that's uh, where we started with the idea of Fabric. Fantastic. Well, same question to you, Govinda. Yeah. So um, my background, most of my career has been in both the hedge fund as well as very large sort of 15 plus billion single family office space. And um, my role has very much been around portfolio construction and risk management during that time. Rick and I have known each other for about 20 years or so now, going back to his, well, more like, yeah, going on. It's been a long time going back to his time uh, at, at, uh, at Bridgewater Associates. So we've known each other for a number of years. Rick is really was a uh, somewhat of a, I would say, a, uh, a mentor to me in many ways. And then uh, I had been living outside the U.S. for a number of years in Zurich, Switzerland, working there, was coming back to the U.S. And Rick uh, invited me to work with him at the University of, uh, at, of California, UC Regents, the pension fund there. So we worked together there for a couple of years. And when we were done with our work there, we decided to create Fabric really with the idea that we wanted to be able to provide advisors with a level of technology for their clients and solve some of the problems with the same level of sort of rigor that Rick and I saw that happening at the institutional level. Well, I appreciate that background. So let's actually dive into our first segment called Stats All Folks, where this kind of just kicks off the conversation. And I want to talk about 31%. About 31% of investors with about a million to 5 million in assets say they left their advisor because they didn't understand their risk tolerance. And that's according to a white paper by Morningstar. Why is there such a big disconnect, Rick? I, I think part of it is that you can't boil down risk tolerance to a number. You know, people are multidimensional. They care about security. They, they want to not be thrown out on the street, so to speak. So there's that component of risk. Then on top of that, there's another type of risk, which is trying to maintain their lifestyle. They're willing to take more risk there. There's more 
bounds and what they can do. And if they have that taken care of, now it's open field running. And the risk that they would take on the remainder of their portfolio, if they can, if they have more to go, is sort of, you know, more of a willingness to punt, so to speak. And it yeah. changes over the, their lifetime. So the idea that you can put risk into one number or you can sort of canonize a bottle and say, that's it, is, is missing the point. Um, yeah. And I can see, you know, where, yeah, if I were an individual and somebody were saying, hey, you know, your risk is moderate growth, I'd say, wait a minute, you know, it's just not that easy. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that Rick and I actually talk about quite a bit is that this notion of many advisors have engaged over the last few years of being able to use a very simple questionnaire to really understand their client's risk is I think misleading for the clients. And what it does for the advisor is it's, it's this notion of risk monitoring versus risk management. A lot of advisors, they do this questionnaire, they, they put it away in their file so then they can bring it out if they're ever asked by compliance, well, did you assess the risk? And, and, and they think that they've gotten their job done, right? And that's really, that's not risk management, that's compliance. Really knowing the client and understanding what their relationship with risk is, is something that can't really be summarized by a list of questions, right? And so I think that's where, and the industry has become sort of obsessed with risk questionnaires. And I, I, I think that your numbers that you're quoting from Morningstar really reflect the client's lack of feeling understood by that process. And I think it's great that you point out the difference between compliance and actual risk management, because at the end of the day, as you're both saying, it's a, it's a dynamic thing. It's not just set one number and that's your risk score for life, right? Things certainly don't seem to be getting any easier for advisors, especially in today's day and age. But we really can't ignore this evolution from a financial advisor to really a personal risk advisor. Right. So I, I do want to dig into that with both of you. You know, what are the challenges and opportunities around this shift? And what can advisors learn even from the institutional side of things? Rick? So the you know, my my career has been with institutions. And uh, so our first step has been to bring the same level of rigor to what's available for uh, advisors. Uh, and I, and we've been quite successful in doing that. I could say that what we can provide for advisors in terms of the pure technology is as good as what institutions have, but it's not what institutions have because advisors and their clients are not a hedge fund. They're not a portfolio manager who's simply looking at returns. The problem actually that an advisor has with their client is far more complex than what most institutions have. Now, institutions have a lot more moving parts, but basically at the end of the day, it's what's my return, what's my risk on my portfolio, done. With an individual, it all has to be done in the context of your lifespan, of your dreams, aspirations, retirement plans, and so on. So you need to look at having the technology, but you also need to look at things as it's kind of like if institutions cut with a knife or they're cutting on the return side, advisors have to cut with a scissor because they're looking at both the portfolio and the risks there and the risks and changes for the individual. So you want to start with an institution, but if all you do is say, I'm going to wholesale airlift what an institution has and put it in the hands of an advisor, you're going to fail in two ways. One is it won't meet what they need to do. And secondly, it will be unduly complex uh, for their job. Yeah. I, I think if I could add uh, a little bit to what Rick is saying, one of the ways that we contextualize this notion of really working with uh, wealth managers to play that role of, of a risk advisor to their client is actually very intuitive for advisors that 
you know, because some, you know, sometimes risk wants to be framed as just a number. But in reality, even on the institutional side that Rick and I have been on, what we know is that risk has to be understood as, as not just a number, but as a, as, as a narrative, as a sort of a story that you can tell and weave together the different components to look and create that whole picture, right? And so this is something that a lot of advisors are very good at by nature. They know how to tell a story. The narrative comes actually very intuitive for them. So helping advisors to really contextualize things for their clients in that way, whereas on the purely institutional side, you tend to look at risk as only a set of numbers. And, and we know that that's not the right way to do it. And so, yeah, we, we yeah. try to really work with the advisors. Yeah, to understand that. I mean, think of it as human plus machine. Mm -hmm. It's not just technology. Oh, ab absolutely. You need to have the happy marriage between both. But it's funny because when I hear risk or risk management, I immediately think about retirement. And while I know it's only a component of the complete picture of financial plan, you know, it it's all about really optimizing the portfolio to withstand those ebbs and flows of the market. And with about 10,000 people, I think it was the latest number of a day turning 65 and one in four Americans having no retirement savings and those who yeah. do aren't saving enough, you know, how should advisors really be considering balancing that short-term risk, you know, versus retirement? Yeah, yeah, this is a, you know, it's really a terrible situation and it's going to be an overhang that we see more and more over time. There's sort of a, a tragedy really in large scale that we are really kind of oblivious to right now, but as you're pointing out, it's going to be there. And, uh, you know, for some people, it they're past the accumulation and into the decumulation stage, and I think Govinda can get into that more. And uh, you know, it's a it's a problem. I'd say that when you look at short term versus long term, you know, let's back away uh, from say those who are near at retirement uh, to people who are in their twenties or early to mid thirties. You have this span, and what an advisor needs to do with somebody in their 20s to early 30s is it's like a different world than how they manage things based on the wealth that somebody already has when they're 65 or 70. And and short term means different things to those different groups. Uh, I think the big issue, if you're dealing with somebody who's 30 years old, is not what short term risks, how do you manage short term risks, but what short term risks can you ignore? What of it is actually noise, given the time span that you have looking forward? Yeah. And what short-term things, uh, and, and rehearsing for the client what those are, so you're not kind of trying to talk somebody off the ledge, you know, when the thing occurs. Because a lot of times it's like, look, I, we knew this sort of thing could occur in the market. It's happening. But as you already know, we can sit on the sidelines and watch, given its risk and your time frame. But, you know, yeah. I think Govinda could talk more about some of the issues, maybe with the longer, with the people who are more on the retirement side of things. Yeah, the decumulation phase, as has been mentioned, is, uh, is an issue right now. And over time, just from the demographics, will become more and more of an issue. And this is something that we've really uh, focused on at Fabric, is um, creating our technology to really address that decumulation phase as much as the accumulation phase. So a lot of, you know, we've been so sort of obsessively focused on this accumulation phase that, and so a very large part of our focus is understanding uh, the nuance and being able to really address a question of personalization. What does risk mean to this individual based on where they are in their life cycle? And then the easy part is if you have a questionnaire to just fill that out and answer it. The hard part is saying, given the type of environment we're in, given the needs of this individual and their family, what is the appropriate portfolio? And what is a portfolio that is gonna give them the best probability of meeting those goals? And that's the part that a lot of technology tends not to focus on because that's a very difficult question to answer, but it's the key question. You know, you can have a beautiful sort of questionnaire that gives you a risk tolerance. You can have uh, a wonderful 
sort of financial planning software that gives you all of these different statistics. But if you don't have a, the proper portfolio that's going to accommodate that, the rest of it's not going to help much. And so really using technology as it is today to address those issues. So I want to stay on that piece of the technological side of things, because in the past, you know, risk systems almost acted like risk managers, managers mm. themselves, you know, would go and spend time supporting their systems. But I mean, this model has completely yeah. changed at this point with the modern risk manager requiring a system that ultimately supports them rather yeah. than the other way around. Right. So I'm curious, yep. both of your thoughts on how the risk management tech space has evolved and what's the state yeah. of the stack, if you will. Yeah. Maybe I'll, would you like to go ahead, Rick, no, or I can contextualize it? Well, I think just coming back to one thing I said before, which is I think a great context to put it in, is this notion of risk monitoring versus risk management. And a lot of the historic technology that we've used is about monitoring the risk we have, right? And then post that 2008 financial crisis, with the computing power we have, with the, the technology available to us, it's really being able to answer this question that Rick brought up before, this uh, human plus machine, is how can we use technology to empower the advisor, to give them a deeper understanding? Do they know what the risk is? Is that risk appropriate for that individual client? And then if it's not, how do they act on that, right? And, and, and how can they really begin to answer some of those questions and the technology that we have, particularly the ability uh, to model and to model out somebody's life in a way, and then to model the portfolio and then to use some of that, those technological tools to really be able to get a much more precise understanding. Um, do, do, do you wanna to add to that, Rick, a bit? Yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, the whole objective of any technology for an advisor is to leverage their time as opposed to take their time. And, uh, you know, the risk management systems on the institutional side are like, you know, these things have to be babysat and you have a whole bunch of PhDs. You have to sit there to get the thing to work. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, the whole idea, uh, we spend a lot of time on the you know, user interface because ultimately here's the thing that risk, if, if you, do it right, risk actually is not that hard. It's knowing where to look and how to think about it. It's understanding the story. You don't need 15 pages of numbers and 45 graphs. You just don't. Uh, if you don't understand risk and you haven't done risk management, it's kind of like, I don't know what really matters, so I better just like do everything in the world and put it all out there. Uh, but the fact is that if you do things in an intelligent way, it doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to have a million flashing lights. Our application really can be absorbed in one or two screens. And there's a lot of stuff in the background, uh, but you know it's a little bit like uh, you know if you're driving a car, all you know is you have the accelerator and the brake and the steering wheel. You know there's a thousand moving parts, but look, you know ultimately you don't want it to be too hard. Absolutely. Uh, that's a great point. And I'm curious your thoughts too. Obviously, risk that involves a lot of data on someone, or it can at least. Um, as you said, it doesn't have to be difficult. But how has the commoditization of data changed the risk management landscape? What are you seeing there? Uh, I think Govinda is probably the best <laughs> to talk on that because he's closer to kind of those turning wheels that kind of take and crunch the data. Yeah, I mean, it's really been um, there, you know, as we all know, it's it's no uh, news to anyone that it's we have sort of a, a revolution in the amount of data and also the how well that data is organized. And then there's a notion of the commoditization of that. But so now, you know, there's groups like performance reporting groups in particular, like Adapa or Tamarack or Orion that um, have really done such an amazing job at pulling in that data and organizing that data. And then on the in the background, at least of our application, we work with uh, MSCI. And MSCI probably has one of the largest aggregated sources of market data out there. And so we're able to pull in the data on the individual, 
on a count by count basis, we're able to pull in the data from their financial planning, whether it's eMoney, Money Guide Pro, whatever that might be. And then we're leveraging the power of a group like MSCI to bring all of that data together and process it in a relevant way to really allow for the um, advisor ultimately to be able to provide more value to that client. So, you know, that commoditization of data and the availability and the organization that's happened over the last really 10 years, but even just the last five years, makes possible a level of analysis and engagement that historically has simply not been possible. And this is one of the difficulties of some of the legacy software is they're simply not built on a platform that can absorb yeah. the sophistication of, of this world yeah. that we're in today. And that's really one of the advantages of being a non-first, a non-prime uh, mover, you know, is we, we get to use the most recent technology Whereas some of the, the people who are best known have legacy systems that just are stuck in the mud. They can't take advantage of what's around right now. Yeah, this is why the banks, you know, many of the large banks that have private wealth management groups are just pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into this area trying to catch up. But it's so difficult because their systems are so antiquated, which has made a huge opportunity for so many new uh, players in yeah. the financial space. You know, it's really it's funny. Amazing. There's one case, I won't mention the firm, but th they actually have three different systems because one system just couldn't be engineered to accommodate the next thing that had to be done. And then they had another one. And then they put a wrapper around the whole thing to make it look like, oh, look, you know, you really actually only have this one system, but it never really works. And, and there's very little they can do to change it because the cost would be huge and they can't risk the disruption to their clients. The yeah. Frankenstack stories are so disappointing. The Frankenstack, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, yeah, right? And so the industry is really undergoing, as everyone knows, just a huge, a huge transformation in this way. And I think that ultimately the benefit is gonna be for the clients themselves. Oh, absolutely. Which leads me into my next question. What's on the roadmap for Fabric? What can we expect coming out of Fabric in 2023 and beyond? Yeah, so it's interesting. As, as we've evolved as a company, what we first were very focused on is to help advisors understand, do you know the risk you have and you have the risk you want at the individual client level? What is the risk that's there? And is that appropriate? And if not, where is it coming from? And how can you fine tune things, right? This was sort of the first level of problem uh, that we solved. And then there was this, uh, because we work closely with MSCI and we use this factor risk and return decomposition, there was a lot of requests from advisors of, okay, how can I work uh, in this asset class space, but using this underlying factor-based engine? And so we built out the ability for them to really do a portfolio rebalancing, taking into account that factor exposure, which is what is underlying the risks within those individual assets. Um, and so uh, now, as we continue to provide value for our clients, the thing that has become the most acute in the request from our current clients is really about portfolio construction. How can you help me use this technology to create a better individual portfolio, not just a, a model, but then take that model and really adjust it for the specific needs of an individual client. And, and so really bridging that gap from really building out a portfolio that will meet the needs of, of that client and, and that has that risk awareness built into it. The, the other area that we're focusing on this year, again, very much as many people know, MSCI has really been leading the market with sort of ESG as well as this notion of climate risk, the risk, the physical risk associated with uh, climate change. And so the other thing that we're rapidly working on developing is being able to understand um, the risks associated with other types of factors, whether they be climate related, uh, and as well, building in the values-based approach where a client can understand that the portfolio both um, 
has the proper risk to meet their goals, but then also is within whatever their personal notion is of how they'd like their portfolio to express their values, which we've learned is really equally as important. So these are the things we're focusing on. Fantastic. Well, that's actually a perfect segue into our next segment, which is Ask Us Anything, where I've gone out to the social universe and asked them to submit questions that they want answered by you guys. So let's see who's dropping into the DMs this week. And actually, funny enough, one of the first questions we had was for you, Rick. And um, this this user wants to know, what are some of the material risks you're focused on in 2023? And I bet climate change is on that list. Yeah. So... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I, I coined the term material risk uh, with the idea of, as I mentioned before, that individuals have a longer time frame than a hedge fund or an institution. Uh, and so some risks matter for individuals or material for individuals, that, but other risks don't really matter. Uh, let me start with the short term and go towards the long term and try to do it quickly. I, you know, short term, of course, everybody's looking at inflation and the prospects of recession. Uh, it doesn't have to literally be a recession. It's just, could there be an economic slowdown that'll be reflected in the market? Uh, and inflation makes it a little more complex because it could be that the Fed gets boxed into a corner and can't deal with both inflation where they want to drop rates and recession uh, or, or sorry, where they want to increase rates, or recession where they want to drop them uh, at the same time. So there's that conundrum that may add more risk and longevity to any sort of a shock. Uh, if you asked me this question a month ago, I'd miss what now is a critical risk, which is with the small and regional banks, uh, the, the prospect for a loss of confidence to spread across the regional banks. So you can end up with sort of a nationwide regional and small bank crisis, which will lead to two things, a major shock for what's already a weakened area, commercial real estate, especially offices, and small businesses could be hit because it'll be more expensive for them to fund, even funding their inventory. Uh, and it's sort of ironic because in 2008, we had something that nobody thought would occur, which was a nationwide residential real estate crisis. Now we might find ourselves with a nationwide commercial real estate crisis in 2000 was because of the big banks. Now it might be because of the small banks. So there's something kind of strange going on. You kind of wonder how we've screwed up so much with regulation. But, but to your point, for a lot of people who are out there today who are in their 20s and 30s and even 40s, the material risks are climate. And I know people hear about it over and over and over again, but it's not like what's going to happen 30 years from now. Even this last summer, we had energy problems from hydroelectric and nuclear. Uh, we had huge heat problems that restricted labor. Uh, you know, you could go on. Uh, some supply chains were hurt because there were droughts and you couldn't get boats going along the rivers. Uh, so climate is really something that's already uh, an area of focus. Another one that you wouldn't have thought of a little over a year ago is deglobalization. But the war in Ukraine sort of has turned things around. The problems with China has turbocharged that. Uh, there's going to be a big shift in supply chains and chains where we get production. And uh, that's going to short-term increase costs, but it'll also increase the robustness of the economy. And long-term, it'll be a positive. Uh, so short, you know, one or two years out, problem. You know, 10 years out, benefit. Okay, so yeah. there's a bit okay. of a silver lining, I was going to say, to, otherwise all of that is going yeah. to cause for panic. <laughs> Sometimes things go the right way, right? <laughs> yes. I'll just add one thing that I know Rick has talked about a lot, but didn't bring up <laughs> now, but it's not really one thing in particular. It's just the, uh, the speed and the velocity to which these things um, can have a contagion, which we did see with Silicon Valley Bank, is it's sort of this, this reverse meme effect. Where, where rather, do, do you want to say something about this? Because I know you speak about yeah, this a lot. Yeah, so sort of I've sort of said mechanism. it's what we're seeing with the banks is kind of, uh, you know, the the meme stocks in reverse. <laughs> meme stocks went up and up because 
the social media just kind of had this feeding frenzy. Right. Uh, what we're seeing now with banks is kind of things going down and spreading because, again, the confidence, lack of confidence frenzy can spread more. That's something that now that's happening, we could have said, oh, yeah, I should have thought of that. Right. But really, who would have thought of it? But now it's evident that this can be a problem. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely. sort of just fuel on the fire. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, speaking of fuel on fire, we did have an interesting question around large language models and how LLMs like GPT are going to disrupt portfolio construction workflows for advisors this year. And what are your predictions around that? And even five years from now? Um, sh should I sort of take a stab at that sure. first, Rick, or you want to? Okay. So it's still... I mean, we, we have to say it's really un, unclear, right? There's a lot of excitement right now um, in this area and there's huge potential in this area. But what we've seen again and again in the wealth management space, whether it was the robo advisors or this notion that some technology is gonna come and completely transform and was talking very specifically about the workflow for advisors now, I think there's huge potential to be able to interact with these sets of data specifically around a given client and potentially have insight be fed back to you and then have that insight be translated into making better decisions. So I think there is a sort of a, a, a decision making component that it can add tremendous value to. But as far as actual portfolio construction or how we work with portfolios. I'll let Rick sort of pick this one up, but we're, you know, we're still trying to understand exactly how that would work. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the chatbots are good at taking information and hopefully increasingly correctly putting it into plain language. That's kind of what they do. Uh, there's other things that can be done with artificial intelligence. Uh, but that's sort of where chat box go. And so if you have uh, a lot of research reports and a lot of information and you don't want to write a customized uh, paper for each individual, you know, chat bots can help you with that. Uh, when it comes to portfolio design and construction, that's a optimization problem. That's not, uh, you know, a, something a chat bot's going to help you with. And And the other thing too is, you know, Advisors deal with people, and every person's unique. Uh, yeah. So it may be a little harder to take some of these AI things and put them into a form. Uh, you know, I, I would say advisors are not readily replaceable uh, yeah. because they have to deal with each individual. And, you know, as we mentioned, not only is each individual different, each individual is different over time than what they are, you know, now. Yeah. Uh, you, so, you yeah. know, so... AI is going to have a lot of power in a lot of different ways. Uh, I, I think it's power in finance has a few limitations for the advisor. It's because there are people on the other end who are each one's different. Uh, the other reason I think there may be limitations is the markets change. You know, we innovate. We have uh, the market today is a different market than it was pre 2008. Right. And so, you know, a chair always looks like a chair. So if you want to train on a chair, you train for, you know, artificial intelligence to recognize chairs, fine. You know, you can do it. And you have a million examples of chairs. You can't do that for the market because even if you try to train on the market of 2004, it, it's just not the same place yeah. that we are now. So it's interesting. If I reframe that question just a little bit, and, you know, we could go on all day talking about this, so I, I'll, I'll keep it short. But if we reframe frame that question a little bit, and keep in mind, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, the question is about wealth management, not investment management. Correct. Right? So when it comes to investment management, you know, investment management is one area. And then there's wealth management. Wealth management is very particular because that's where we engage individuals. Right. And this is where the industry really, um, you know, should and is focused. But when it comes to the question there, um, think about it in this way. At what point is this technology going to be able to give us insight 
on an individual by individual basis. So at what point will, will this the, the sort of um, you know, chatbots be able to give us insight on an individual? And that's when you'll know that they can really impact that wealth conversation. <laughs> and that's when right? they'll take over the world. Yes, that's, that's exactly where I was going. World. But <laughs> if you want to use a chatbot to replace your risk questionnaire, you're probably going to give, get that same 31% of clients leaving advisors. <laughs> I'm just going to caution right now. <laughs> I would I would completely agree. And we had one final question for the segment before we before we move on. Um, how does Fabric differentiate itself from other risk management tools out on the market right now? Yeah, can I get that one, Rick? Sure. Yeah. So I think you know we um, we have respect for everyone out there and what they're doing. So I just want to preface what I'm saying that we you know we do respect what everyone is doing and what we're doing is somewhat different and how it's different is in that um as rick had it mentioned a couple times during the show we although we come from very institutional backgrounds we very well acknowledge that that institutional framework for risk cannot be picked up and dropped into the wealth management context and what we see is a lot of people doing that mm. right we see that people are looking to these sort of you know, models that in many cases are, are even in the institutional space quite outdated and then just trying to drop them in and apply them in this wealth management context and we feel that doesn't work. So one of the things that Rick and I did is we actually spent several years working with talking to literally hundreds of advisors to understand how do you work with your clients? What, what does this mean to you? And what are the problems that you would like to have solved that would really make a difference in how you work with clients and, and the value you provide. And so we really engineered the whole thing around the advisor experience in that way. And so that, um, I'm not saying other people haven't, but you know, I'm seeing a lot of sort of really like institutional risk things dropped into the wealth space. And that's sort of what we see there. So then the other thing that's very unique about what we're doing, um, for the wealth space, right, is that we have this partnership with MSCI, this, this relationship with MSCI, and MSCI is really one of the leading data providers, and they have their uh, factor models, uh, private asset models as well, and mostly that data and those analytics and that whole ecosystem is really only available to institutions, right, for two reasons. One, the cost is just prohibitive, and for two, if you're working directly with that data, if you don't have a team of engineers and uh, financial, uh, financial engineers to work with that data, you're gonna be lost. So we've done two things. Is one, we've brought in that data into the ecosystem. We've made it relevant to helping us solve problems for advisors. And we've also done that in a cost-effective way. And in a way that creates a user experience for the advisor you don't have to have a, a PhD in financial engineering or whatever. So it's really, um, I think those are some of the uh, things that are, are unique uh, about what we're doing. And I think also one of the things that's just a bit unique is our team, is that we really have a team of typically uh, problem solvers or people from a very solid institutional background that are all aligned around one commitment, which is that the wealth management industry really wants to be transformed in how it works with risk, Rick, <laughs> risk and portfolio <laughs> construction. With uh, Rick's risk. That's right. <laughs> right, with risk and portfolio construction in order to solve some of these problems for, for the clients. Um, and I could go on <laughs> about ways in which I feel you know, that we um, distinguish ourselves, but I'll stop at that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the context. And, you know, it's interesting because generally we see a lot of those factor-based or just old risk models looking in the past and building off of past data, historical data. Yeah. So very encouraging to hear that it's, you know, proactive and forward looking with, with Fabric. Um, but I do yeah. want to move on now to our 
third and final segment. And I do appreciate you both being put in the hot seat. So thank you. Um, But this is probably my favorite segment because I love to wrap up podcasts in a fun way. And I call it stack it or whack it. And I'm going to throw out a few technologies and be warned. uh, They're not always wealth tech related. And you essentially tell me if they're worth the hype or not. So Rick, I'm going to start with you um, and the impact of AI and portfolio management. I know we talked about a little bit, but you know, stack it or whack it in its current state? Are there still issues with incomplete data sets, training large data sets? What do you think? <laughs> I'd say I'm probably the only one who will say this. I'd say whack it. Interesting. And the reason is that I that people, and I, I mentioned this earlier, but people look at the applications of AI in other areas and think it can then be uh, you know, put into the world of finance uh, machine learning, large data, you know, when you're looking at big data models, we don't have big data. We may think that we do, but we don't because, again, it's hard to use market data that's you know, five years old, 10, 20 years old, pick a number. It's just stale. It's from a different world. And there's not that much data anyway. Uh, if you look at, you know, daily data and you say, oh, I've got 5,000 stocks, daily data going down 20 years. However you try to figure it out, it's on the order of a million to 10 million pieces of data, very highly correlated, so they're not really that rich. Uh, So I think a lot of the machine learning, uh, big data, AI applications, you know, uh, just don't follow through. And, And it's interesting, I'm on the advisory board for the uh, master's financial engineering uh, at uh, the Haas School at Berkeley. And everybody, virtually everybody coming in in their resume has machine learning as one of their special areas, you know, because it's just this hot area uh, to, to be in. And if you're doing automated driving, fine. I just don't think it translates as well into finances as a lot of people hope it will. Oh, interesting take. I appreciate that. Well, the next one is for you, Govinda, and I know we talked about this too, but risk tolerance questionnaires, are they in need of an upgrade to keep pace with real-time market movements, stack it or whack it and with where they stand now? Yeah, I I would have to say from our view, we would we would whack it. Two whack um, it. All right. <laughs> yeah. And, and the reason why is because um, I think from a compliance perspective, they have value, right? No doubt about that. Now, do they give the advisor real insight or understanding of their client? And and if so, it might be in that moment. But but clients, humans are complex, evolving, you know, sophisticated creatures, and we respond to our environment, we respond to each other. And and to be and then money is something that is probably, we know, one of the most emotional things for us as human beings. So to try to wrap that up in a set of questions is just very, uh, I, I don't think, um, I don't think that's very doable. No, it makes, I mean, and, and at the end of the day, it's just a snapshot in time, right? Like, in the, yeah. as we discussed, it's right. dynamic, it's ever yeah. evolving. So but it can't can, just be set yeah. it and forget it. <laughs> yeah, we can ask ourselves this question. What aspect of, hum, of the human being can be summarized with a few questions? Now, granted, there are human resource people that go to college they have master's degrees. Some of them have PhDs in being able to do a personality assessment, right? And, and, and these people are trained for years and years and years. And they don't just have a simple questionnaire. It's a process that takes days and days of refinement. Now, if you want to get advisors into this, you know, into that level of creating a questionnaire that really delves into the depths of someone's psyche to really understand what drives them around money, which is like one of the most subtle things in human. Okay, maybe that could be done. But like these 15 question questionnaires, 20 questions, you know, that you see from everywhere. No, I think we're yeah. fooling ourselves. Or instead, the advisor can sit and get to know their client. There's there always that. There you go. 
Uh, that's a perf perfect spot to end that. <laughs> Actually, great advice. Yeah. Rick, Govinda, been an absolute pleasure chatting with both of you. Uh, feel free to tell listeners where they can find out more about uh, both of you and what you're working on at Fabric. Oh, yeah. So please, um, if you would like to uh, come to us, you can uh, Google Fabric Risk or you can come to www.fabricrisk.com and um, you know, you can reach out and if you uh, do a demo of the application, you'd be doing that demo uh, with me. So if you're interested, come to the uh, come to the website, sign up for a demo and I'd love to uh, to chat with you and you can actually, you know, you can talk to me about anything really. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <the> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you both again. And be sure to like and subscribe to the WellStack podcast on all major podcasting platforms and follow all things WellStack on wealthmanagement.com, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And thank you all for tuning in today. Today's episode is sponsored by Wells Fargo Advisors Financial Network, Finet, member SIPC. Finet is focused on helping independent advisors support their clients and reach their goals with unique, ever-evolving solutions and resources from one of the nation's largest financial institutions. Learn how you can get more with Finet at wfa.com independent. That's wfa.com independent.